Sorry, everyone, about the, the glitch in our recording. We are now going to continue with Dr. Amy Edwards, who is our um, feral cat person. <laughs> um, so, Dr. Amy Edwards grew up on a sugarcane farm in far north Queensland before moving to Brisbane to complete her Bachelor of Science at University of Queensland. From here, Amy moved to Tasmania and completed her PhD in reproductive, reproductive zoology, focusing on captive breeding. She has spent three years at La Trobe University in Melbourne, completing a postdoctoral appointment before moving to National Parks and Wildlife Service in Dubbo last September. Amy is the Western Project Officer for the New South Wales Environmental Trust Feral Cat Management Team. Her main interest is conservation of Australia's mammals and her favourite thing in the world is her Whippet Luna. Okay, over to you, Amy. Thanks so much for that. Um, so I will jump straight into feral cats in Australia. My thing works. So Australia was one of the last places to be cat free. There is evidence to suggest that cats uh, were here before James Cook arrived, but just how long before is really unknown. There is also evidence of Aboriginal words and knowledge about cats dating back quite a while, suggesting they may have been here longer than we think. It seems that they really established after the 1700s. By 1890, cats had established on around 99% of Australian land, and a study by Leg and colleagues suggests that they occupy 99.8% of land now. There is essentially nowhere in mainland Australia that is cat free anymore. So if you have a look at this map, you can see that cats are introduced in the cooler colours, the blues around Sydney and Perth, and they've spread right through to the central Australia by 1890. So the areas that are cat free in Australia are few and far between. There are 19 listed sites that are truly predator free enclosures. They range from 0.5 to 123 kilometers squared with a total area size of only 350 kilometers squared, which isn't much at all. There are 5,448 islands around Australia, including Tasmania, and only 592 of these are known to be cat free. Leg and colleagues also have estimated there are around 2.07 million cats in Australia, which equates to around 0.27 cats per kilometre squared. We often say things are different out west in terms of cats, that is very true. We see the most dramatic fluctuations in cat numbers in arid and semi-arid areas, and this is due to the lower productivity of the land. There is less reliable food during dry times, in terms of low rainfall, we generally um, estimate cat numbers to be around 0.18 cat per kilometre squared, while this can get up to 0.76 cats in times of high rainfall, which is quite a lot more than the national average of 0.27. This is driven mostly by the boom bust cycles of prey. We know that prey such as rabbits and mice will boom particularly after rain. While many people think that cats control rabbits, it generally seems to be the other way around that rabbits control cat numbers. The more rabbits they are, the more the cats will breed up. It's easy food for them. Once the rabbit food dries up and the rabbits die off, the cats will too. The food source just isn't reliable out here. Um, so we see this boom bust cycle very dramatically. So the real problem is the impact that cats have on the environment, on agriculture and the economy. And the reason this is the reason that cat control is listed as a key priority in New South Wales. Predation, competition and disease encompass most of the impacts that cats have. So predation to start, Australia is very special in that over 90% of our species occur here and nowhere else. However, since settlement around 65,000 years ago, we've lost much of our fauna. In particular during this time was the megafauna that we lost. We have, however, had an insane rate of extinction since European settlement, which was only about 200 odd years ago. 
we've lost 37% of our mammal species, 10% of birds, and 5% of frog species. To lose that many species in the short time frame is unheard of. Predation by cats is one of the leading concerns for the extinction of our species going forward. While there are many other reasons we are losing species, cat predation is definitely up there. So what exactly are cats eating? Most studies suggest the majority of their diet is mammals, but also a large portion is birds, reptiles, insects, and eggs. Cats need to intake around 300 grams of meat each day, which is quite a lot for a small animal. If we look at uh, a study on birds, Jones did in 1977, he calculated that one cat can eat as many as 154 birds per year. While Winowski estimated that feral cats as a whole are currently taking around 400 million birds per year, which is roughly three to 4% of our bird population every year. It's quite a significant dent from one factor alone. And to look at their impact on mammals, it's been estimated that feral cats are killing 880 million mammals per year, native and introduced, with an additional 150 million killed in modified environments, and again, an additional 180 million killed by pet cats. That's a lot of millions. Interestingly, it appears that native mammal kills outnumber introduced mammal kills, so cats are actually taking more native wildlife than rabbits and mice. A study by Spencer in 1991 showed that within an eight month period, one cat had killed two adults, one subadult, and five young at foot rock wallabies. This caused a 70% decline in that one population, one cat causing a massive crash in a population of an endangered species. And this isn't the only example of something like this happening. In terms of competition, I won't go into detail here, but diet overlaps is the biggest form of competition followed by competition for shelter and denning sites. And then we get on to disease. Cats harbor 50 zoonotic diseases, so those that can be transferred from hu to humans and livestock. The four most significant are toxo roundworm, cat scratch, and sarco. Toxo is one of the world's most common parasites. Cats are the sole primary host in Australia. Other species acquire it by ingesting oocysts in infected cat feces, by ingesting infected birds, mammals, or insects, or through the placenta during pregnancy. Toxo varies regionally, and there is evidence to suggest we are in a good place. Where Toxo prefers humid, cooler places, we are a bit hot and dry for it to subsist in the environment for too long. I won't go into the specifics of the life cycle of the parasite, but more will focus on the impact uh, that it has. It can be detrimental to native animals, but it also has a large impact for agriculture. So in chickens, we're seeing issues with the central nervous system, motor function and reproduction. While in sheep, goats and cattle, we get more transient symptoms, simple things such as diarrhea. But the biggest issue is in their reproduction. When females get infected during pregnancy, we see things such as abortion, stillbirth or mortality of newborns, which is a real concern. So much so that the Kangaroo Island meat industry estimates that Sarko and Toxo cost the industry $2 million per year, while estimates for sheep farming in South Australia estimate Toxo alone cost the state $70 million. So it's not an insignificant amount. So how can we manage the feral cats? You'll be pleased to know that Australia is actually leading the way in management of feral cats. It is estimated we are killing around 210,000 cats per year, but unfortunately that is only around 10% of their population. There are a few ways in which cats can be controlled. Cat exclusion using fences or predator-free islands, baiting, trapping, shooting, hunting, habitat management such as fire regimes, controlling food through uh, things like controlling rabbits, predators, reintroduction of dingoes into certain areas, trap neuter release, biological controls and gene drive. Uh, we're only going to focus on baiting here. I won't get into the others. Um, I'm not an expert on anything at all really, but uh, baiting I can tell you a little bit about. So baiting has been occurring in Australia for some time. Most of our efforts have been focused on foxes and dogs. In 2003, it was estimated that we baited 82,000 square kilometres for fox control for conservation only. This was equaled or surpassed by baiting for agricultural reasons. So it's quite a lot of area being baited. 
1080 is our most commonly used bait. And while it isn't perfect, and I personally don't like it, it is the lesser of the evils at present until something better is designed. The main reason is due to its ability to target introduced predators. Some Australian native animals are more tolerant to 1080 than our introduced pests due to the presence of the compound in the environment here. Gastrolobium and Gigi trees, among other plants, have the compound in them, and so there's a natural tolerance from many Australian animals. Most of these plants are found in south, the southwest of the country, but the tolerance in some species seems to be Australia-wide, which is good. The problem is we don't often bait for cats because we know it doesn't really work. As we know, there is a limited bait uptake by cats generally, so we need to work out what we can do to improve cat uptake. Cats prefer live prey, but we can improve uptake by baiting when food is scarce. During drier times, uh, we do see a bigger uptake by cats. Cats won't dig. So baits that are buried for dogs and foxes won't be taken by cats. If you are targeting cats, you can't bury the bait. This leaves the baits open to uptake by native animals or non-target species, which isn't great. And it does result in a loss of bait available for cats and also risks the non-target species. There is some evidence to suggest that cats do prefer fresh meat over dry meat, but there's also some evidence to suggest that this isn't always true. So cats are particularly difficult. We have made some attempts to improve cat baiting. In Western Australia, they have developed Eradicat. It is a sausage style bait with 1080 in it. It's quite small. It's registered in Western Australia, but not for use in New South Wales. The reason being is that the dosage is quite high for a small sausage. It puts our native animals at risk. In larger fox and dog baits, the natives have to eat quite a large amount of meat to ingest the same amount of poison. Whereas with these small baits, it's a bit too easy for them to eat one or more and get quite a high dosage of poison. History is another one. We've had quite a few studies looking into history. It's essentially an eradicate style sausage, but the 1080 is stored inside a pellet. The thought being that predators like cats will swallow the bait and the capsule whole, which releases on contact with stomach acid. While native animals will nibble at the bait and should discard the pellet, but more work is needed here um, for sure. And then we have baits like Curiosity. Curiosity uses PAP rather than 1080, the benefit being that there is an antidote. So accidental ingestion by pets can sometimes be reversed. However, this style of toxin doesn't discriminate. It's very dangerous to use around native animals that might be taking meat baits. So this brings us to where we come in. I'm part of the Environmental Trust Feral Cat Management Team. We've been working for just over a year in New South Wales. We're trying at the moment to get a baseline of cat numbers and behaviour and prey numbers and prey behaviour. Our aim is to determine if there is a method to control cats at the large landscape scale. And that's why we're focusing on baiting rather than the alternatives. We are set in three eco regions, the north, the south and out here in the west. Each region has three sites, so a total of nine sites across the state. At least one experimental site in each region and one to two control sites. We know that things that work in the north may not necessarily work in the south or out west, so hopefully we can come up with one or more recipes of how we can better target cats with baiting. This project is a joint collaboration between the Vertebrate Pest Research Unit in the Department of Regional New South Wales, National Parks and Wildlife, and the University of New England. To date so far, across the state, we have established over a thousand camera traps. In the West, we have dug nearly 500 pitfall holes and also completed thousands of trap nights for quolls, possums, and bandicoots. In the Western region, we are monitoring cats, other predators, and prey using cameras, pitfalls, some more cameras, uh, cameras on pitfalls, GPS collars, and some more cameras. So with all that talk about cameras, I thought I'd share some photos of what we've brought in over the last year. So we do have some nice predators out there. We've got dogs, foxes, and cats. And then we've also got some cat food or prey. We've got reptiles, a little rabbit down there, a mallee fowl, and even some native marsupials like this little kultar, if you can see him hiding in the middle. And then we just get our regular visitors that like to dance around in front of our cameras, give us a little bit of entertainment. So pitfalling for those of you that haven't had the joy of digging holes in a clay pan before, 
involves digging these deep holes with a fence that runs across the top. The idea being that small mammals and reptiles will hit the fence, run along it and end up falling down one of the holes. We track the holes twice a day and record all the little guys that we catch. Uh, these little guys are what we like to refer to as cat food. So we have our little southern Ningawis. We've got some common Dunarts, one with a very full pouch. We get reptiles too, this little sanguana, some geckos, dragons, uh, skinks. And this year we even caught an endangered red-tailed worm lizard. So our plan is to monitor current methods of baiting, which we've been doing for a year while bringing in all of these baseline studies um, about cat numbers and prey numbers. And then we'll see if we can adapt these current methods to further upregulate cat uptake of bait before trialling any of the newer methods. At this stage I can't really give any more information about uh, what we will be doing as each year, the results of each year determine what we'll be doing in the next and at this stage we're still still just monitoring uh, so no plans have actually been formed yet. So hopefully we will have some results and a recipe for cat control in the coming years but at this stage uh, we ask you just to stay tuned and know that we are out there trying our best to get a handle on these feral cats. Uh, and I have lots of people to acknowledge, particularly my team, uh, our funders and all of our volunteers and staff. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Amy. We will do questions now at the end of it. I'm just going to change screens, so just bear with me. So if anybody's got any questions, can you please type them in your question box and send them through to me now? So Amy, obviously there's um we've got a um a question coming through here. What sort of cat densities do you normally see? Uh that's a very good question, mostly because I can't answer it. We haven't estimated any cat densities as yet. Um we are currently putting all of our data together. Um, I know there was some studies that have tried to get cat estimates um, out in the West. Um, in terms of Australia, generally the arid and semi-arid really fluctuates based on the year. So anywhere from um, 0.16 cats per square kilometre all the way up to 0.76 cats per square kilometre. Um, but in terms of our area in Western New South Wales, um, we don't have those numbers yet. So not something that I can provide. Hopefully uh, if we're back next year, I'll have those numbers. Okay, thank you, Amy. That's the only question that we've had so far come through. So we're gonna change back now to Phil Sampson and kick off where we left off when the whole system crashed. So back over to you, Phil, as soon as I change screens with you. What did we lose? <laughs> Good question. How far did I get through and what did it fall apart, did it? Yeah, we, we crashed completely. So um, yeah, if you wanna go um, back to maybe the last thing I seen was Pindone. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. So you say I was talking to myself. Yeah, that's okay. That's pretty cool. <laughs> and if we've got any other questions for Amy, um, please send them through as well. We can ask them at the end as well. So, all right, over to you, Phil.
Okay, I was talking about pin known being a useful tool in uh, in urban areas and in areas where there's more sensitivity towards uh, domestic working dogs and pets and so forth. Uh, my issue was that I've had so many people give me feedback that doesn't work. It doesn't work because people don't follow the label. They don't give that uh, that 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 gazetted gap of uh, you know four day gap, five day gap, and they they don't do that. So therefore, the pin down does not have the effect that's supposed to have. It needs to build up, then build up, then build up again. Then it's when it becomes lethal. So it's important that if you're going to use pin down, very important to follow the instructions and and don't deviate from that. Uh, my next point I was talking about was baiting on large projects was. Um, I think I've done that one out, sorry, was the need to have accuracy and um, that was important from a point of view of we've got the equipment out there, we do spraying with it, we do other, other agricultural things like seeding and so forth. Some of that lower cost equipment can be adapted very well and can be used to uh, ensure that um, um, that you've got accuracy over long distances. It's very hard if you're going to try and do a, a 200 kilometre trail without um, having some sort of guidance system. We talked about then, I talked about the difference between oats and carrot. Um, carrot is the preferred um, option from, from our point of view and probably also from local land services, but oats have a place where you cannot transport, cannot keep and cannot use carrots um, on large scale projects. So keep in mind that you need to have baiting equipment that is just as accurate when you're using um, oats as it is with carrots. On the right is the equipment we used for the Nimikaira project. That was some 240, 250 kilometer bait trail. But because we couldn't start until uh, often 7 p.m. because of the high temperatures during the afternoon and carrots are quite sensitive to hot weather, um, we were working in temperatures over 40 degrees some days. So we would wait until seven, up by seven, and work through until dark by just focusing on 50 kilometers each. So we need to have a constant supply of carrots. This is where local land services support us quite well from Millibane. I don't know why it's going backwards, mate. I've got no idea what's going on here. My apologies. Um, all right, let's talk about fumigation for a moment. The um, the need to identify every opening when you're um, when you're using a uh, aluminium phosphide uh, tablet as a fumigant is so critical. The research in Victoria showed that 90% failure is what you expect if you don't use some sort of identification smoke or some tool in order to identify every single opening. Um, leaving one or two without being closed off will simply let that um, that gas escape, and therefore it will be less than lethal dose. <laughs> Shot on the right, just for your interest. The guy, um, the guy helping us here in the yellow, if you can see him, um, he's looking for unexploded ordnance, uh, unexploded uh, bombs. That's the Pakapunyal Army Base Artillery site. And we spent uh, nearly six months there doing a massive pest animal control program. And the tanks on the hill are used as, a, uh, as targets at night for uh, dummy weaponry. But so, uh, as I said before, king brown snakes aren't the only thing to worry about when you've got unexploded bombs around you. So these smoker units, we've developed those because we had to have one that was lightweight. We had a, our first major project was some very hilly country uh, near Elmhurst in Victoria. So we wanted to make a machine which was less than 10 kilograms. We got away from using diesel. We wanted to use um, something like baby oil, mineral oil, which was far less toxic and uh, far more easier to work with. So um, Butch uh, set about to design this and uh, with a couple of prototypes, we come up with the current machine, which we've now sold simply hundreds of those across Australia. And uh, they're in totally reliable. And uh, as I said, you need to have something along those lines. Biological measures. Um, we were, I was about when the Mixo was being released, of course, uh, and it was highly effective, but not as effective as what the, um, the first Khaleesi virus came out. We had 10 years, we had 10 years of no rabbits and that was, was the chance of a lifetime for us to get on top of the situation by destroying all their warrens. We didn't do that. Uh, we didn't get funding at the time, so ripping didn't go ahead and the warrens weren't destroyed. And when the uh, virus ran its course, the rabbits were easy to re-establish re themselves quite quickly. The last virus, K5, we were involved somewhat in this distribution of the carrot. 
it didn't really work that well for us. We didn't see it vector away from the properties we released it on. So let's hope we see more funding in the in the near future to uh, to get those uh, those viruses up and running. Shooting. Uh, let me touch on that just quickly. Whether it be contractors or whether it be recreational shooters, I think there's a huge role still. Um, firearms are less than desirable these days. They seem to be the the um, enemy of the state. Uh, but they have a great great purpose and, and I think if you have a good reliable recreational team of shooters they can visit the property regularly they can have a fair impact and uh, our example was I spent 18 years fishing and hunting on Berrawinia near Maud and we uh, we recorded our kills and over that period we killed 3,700 foxes and that would have had some impact surely but uh, even today I'm still an active rabbit shooter and still do a lot of pig, deer and, uh, and fox work and so forth. And I think it's it's important to have reliable shooters and to keep that uh, that option up our sleeve. Exclusion fencing, this was a site at Munger National Park where the endangered, uh, endangered um, uh, wattle was being uh, attacked. They put exclusion fencing up but didn't maintain it unfortunately. A couple of fallen trees, rabbits re-entered the site and this was the outcome. Um, so if you do do exclusion fencing, it must be maintained and must be kept in uh, good condition. Carrot, uh, carrot cutting has always been a problem to us. With our precision baiting machines, we weren't getting precision carrots. Uh, they were coming from all different machines being supplied to us and we were having trouble calibrating with different things. So we were asked by local land services to uh, develop and design new carrot cutters, which we've done for them. And the first five of those have gone out. So. Uh, when we're given the challenge, we're quite happy to uh, to work on new machines. Lastly, the, um, the relaunch of the Roadnator R3 machine is coming up hopefully in February. The machine uh, the machine manufacturer went out of business. He, he actually sold up the business and the new owners have set about to, to, re, to redesign and redevelop the whole thing. Um, following the research done by DPI Centre in Orange, uh, where Amy's from, uh, Dr. Steve McLeod worked independently uh, with a federal grant uh, sponsored by Parks Victoria and, uh, as well. And it came out ranked third on the PestMart Humane Matrix. We weren't checking for Warren destruction, we were checking for how humane the product was. And uh, we were exceptionally pleased with the outcome. Um, we've had it approved in recent years for use on multiple occasions where ripping was restricted because of Indigenous concerns. So that's quite a good tool to have up your sleeve. The operating procedures are still being finalised and they'll be that's being done by Dr Trudy Sharp and um, we'll keep an eye on that and let you know when those are released. This is a photo that I've used quite often in promotions. I guess I really should explain it. It was taken with a, um, at a site at um, Sunny Ridge up near Yass and this is the impact of what the road noter does. It's 98% pure oxygen with 2% LPG. Um, that was about a four minute um, uh, underground release. And it looks spectacular. It's not what we really look for. This is more what we look for. This is a site at uh, Nimi Kaira, north of Beryl Reynold. And we're trying to get an implosion. We're trying to get the most disruption underground. And that's what we look for. So we're looking for openings, say five to seven openings, maybe eight. We're not looking for massive warrants. We're looking for this to use this where ripping is not appropriate or, or not, not uh, worth funding. So keep in mind the R3 will be getting re released in February and we'll be doing demonstrations across the country. So just in quick summary, war on destruction, I believe ripping is still your first and foremost uh, choice. Uh, not just box one for removal, any habitat where rabbits are living above ground, if you can reduce that amount, that will help because your ripping is going to be more effective when combined with it. 1080 baiting, as Amy has said, it's our, the better of two evils at the moment or more. We haven't got a choice yet. When we do, we'll move forward. Baiting with pindone needs to be followed closely with the label. Fumigation, always use a smoker. Let's hope there's more money available for biological measures in the future. Shooting, don't just disregard it. It's a great option for, uh, for recreational guys to visit regularly or a contractor. Exclusion fencing must be maintained. Ferreting, we still see there down closer to the larger cities and uh, still has a place, particularly in um, parklands and things where we can't have any other option. And uh, with our implosion, with our road noter machine, we'll be looking for that in the uh, in the next couple of months to re-release. I can be contacted, and we have a website, and uh, happy to uh, to talk to anyone anytime. Thanks very much for your time, folks.
Thank you very much, Phil. Um, very informative. Um, I've just got a couple of questions to run by you. So the rotonator's availability, uh, obviously not made here in Australia. So yeah, how long before it is available here in Australia? Our most recent discussion was a prototype will be sent to us dispatch on the 23rd of December. So we're hoping to see that here in uh, early January and uh, we'll be releasing that for, for demonstrations and so forth in February. Okay, and what do they cost? Well, the previous system was about $3,000 plus GST. That gave you the complete package of, of hoses and regulators and safety equipment, carry boxes. I don't know the new price. I don't think it'll be far off that. Um, we'll be working hard to make sure it doesn't get expensive. We also make uh, carry frames for utes, for RTVs, for ATVs. We also make, as you see, the smokers. Um, we make a hose reel. So we've got all those added, added value items as well being made here in Australia. But um, we are hopeful that this, this, these guys are quite genuine. We've been dealing with them for nearly a year now in the rebuilding of the factory. I haven't been able to travel there this year because of COVID, unfortunately, otherwise I would have been on site to, uh, to supervise it because we developed the first one, of course. Um, that's all I can say is let's hope it comes through in February. Um, does anybody else have any more questions? Would you like to send them through um, before we end this webinar? I'll give you a few minutes on that. I'd like a question for Amy if Amy's there. Yeah. Yeah, Amy, how many, how much research do we know about cat habitat as far as where they're uh, where they're camped up? I mean, I've I've seen them coming out of warrens all the time. Are they in the warrens hunting, or are they in the warrens living in there? I think it um it depends on the environment. They definitely do live in unused burrows and warrens. I don't think they would share a home with a rabbit right. um, and I'm not entirely sure about them hunting in a warren either you would imagine that the rabbit would have the upper hand um, we see them coming we, we, we see them coming in and out of warrens quite regularly with a baby rabbit in their mouth so they are going in there to find oh, the to British. take babies yeah for yeah. sure and coming out with half grown rabbits and we, we regularly see that at night um, Quite more, more, more than what well, the pick of this time of the year during the breeding season. We saw them again last night. Yeah, that's not a surprise at all. I mean, they do take advantage of most animals that nest, um, that hide their young. They'll find the young and just slowly pick them off as they yeah. want. Um, but they they do use un, unused burrows um, to raise their own young as well. Okay. One observation we made in that uh, 12 months on Nimikari, we recorded 1,004 uh, foxes. That was a combination of 90% of our bait takes, we assume, was a killed fox. The rest was, was shot. We only shot 67 cats for the whole year, yet we shot uh, close on 450 foxes. And we would have probably spotted 150 cats and we couldn't get to shoot them because they just wouldn't stay still. So I think they're going to be tough to, to, to shoot as far as that's concerned. They are, yeah, a lot harder than foxes. Yeah, they seem yeah. to be the trickiest to get with every every method. They're yes. the hardest to trap, the hardest to shoot, and the hardest to bait. So that's why they're doing so well. We used a, a kitten distress call, which tended to work fairly well to make them stand up and look. Um, they didn't respond to... Uh, to the normal fox calls, but they did respond to a, uh, a kitten distress call, which we have on electronic devices we use. Interesting, good to know. Yes. Everyone, 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 everyone worries about their youngsters. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Okay, thanks guys. I'd like to thank both Dr. Amy Edwards and Phil Sampson for their time tonight. I also like to apologise for the glitches that we had. Um, thank you everyone for attending today's webinar. If you could please take the time to complete the post webinar survey. Um, it's a great way to provide feedback to us and guide future events. If you have any further questions, um, please feel free to contact Phil Baird who will be, his email address will be on the follow-up email for any questions that you have. 
You will also receive a follow up email with a link to the recording of this webinar um, and you'll receive that by tomorrow night. So once again, thank you to both our presenters for trying times, but um, very well presented content. So thank you guys, much appreciated. And thank you to everyone that attended tonight. Thank you, Lee. Thank you, Amy. Thank you.